Poland's FA-50 story has always been framed as a straightforward upgrade path, by an interim trainer-like combat aircraft from South Korea, use it to patch capability gaps, then modernize it into a true light fighter standard that can meaningfully complement the F-16s and eventually work alongside the incoming F-35s. Simple, clean, and politically easy to explain. But the newest signal from Warsaw is the opposite of clean. Poland is now saying its delivered F-A-50 GF jets will not be upgraded to the F-A-50 PL or Block 20-like standard, and the official justification is economic inexpediency. That sounds like a budget line item decision. In reality, it reads like a strategic workaround for problems Poland did not fully control in the first place. Here is the part that should make you pause. Polish Air Force leadership points to the F-A-50 GF's Israeli-made ELTA ELM-2032 radar and argues it performs well, even comparing it favorably to the radar on Poland's F-16C divided by D fleet. At first glance, that sounds almost provocative. The F-16 is a proven multi-role fighter. The F-A-50 is a lightweight platform that many still think of primarily as a flying desk, a trainer with teeth. So why would Poland publicly emphasize radar performance instead of the obvious gap, weapon integration and overall combat system maturity? Because radar isn't the bottleneck they're actually fighting. The real bottleneck is permission, timelines, and integration politics. If you strip this down to fundamentals, Poland bought the F-A-50 GF for two reasons, to accelerate pilot production and to create an affordable secondary platform that can take on easier missions so the expensive jets can focus on the hardest ones. That training role matters more than it looks. Poland is simultaneously operating F-16s, preparing for F-35s, and expanding overall air capability under severe regional pressure. Training capacity becomes a strategic resource. Every hour you can reliably generate in the air, every aircraft you can dedicate to syllabi rather than operational scramble, is leverage. South Korean pilots have even suggested that transitioning from this class of trainer to a frontline fighter can be extremely fast, on the order of a few dozen training hours, with some claims as low as about 11 hours for certain transitions under specific conditions. Whether you believe the lowest number or not, the direction is clear, these jets can accelerate throughput. And in an environment where time is the most expensive commodity, that alone can justify keeping a subset of aircraft pure training assets rather than chasing an expensive combat upgrade. But then comes the uncomfortable question, if Poland is already receiving later aircraft in a more Polish FA-50 PL configuration, with a broader fighter-like functionality and a different weapons and sensor roadmap, why not bring the early GF jets up to the same baseline? Wouldn't standardization reduce maintenance complexity, simplify pilot conversion, and lower life cycle costs? Normally, yes. And that's exactly why the decision feels less like a simple cost calculation and more like a forced choice under uncertainty. Because the key phrase isn't economic. The key phrase is, unknown delivery timeline and unknown configuration certainty. The most revealing element is the reported U.S. refusal to integrate AIM-120 AMRAM onto the FA-50 Block 20 baseline that underpins Poland's PL concept, at least as currently pursued. That single issue is a strategic tripwire. Without a credible beyond visual range air-to-air -air missile integration, light fighter, becomes a marketing term rather than a combat role you can plan around. You can still do training, you can still do limited defensive missions, and you can still carry short-range missiles, but the aircraft stops being a realistic supplement in a high-end fight. So what does Poland do when the promised endpoint is suddenly not guaranteed? It freezes sunk cost escalation. It avoids pouring money into upgrading the earliest jets into a standard that might arrive late, arrive incomplete, or require redesign halfway through. And notice how the radar argument suddenly makes more sense. If you can't easily secure the weapons you want, you emphasize what you do have, a radar that is modern enough to be useful, 
potentially newer and more responsive than older mechanically scanned sets like the n apg 68 variants found on many F-16 Block 5052 aircraft. That doesn't mean the F-A-50GF becomes superior to an F-16 in the real world. It means the sensor isn't your showstopper for certain missions. The showstopper is what you can legally, logistically, and politically hang under the wings, and how quickly you can certify it. So Poland pivots to an alternative. If American missiles become a dead end or a delay trap, you look at European munitions that might be politically easier to integrate and procure in parallel. That's why names like Osram and Iris T start appearing in the conversation, and why even air-to-ground options like Brimstone get mentioned. This is not just about shopping around. It is about designing an operational concept that is resilient to supplier friction. Because the lesson Poland and many NATO air forces have learned the hard way is that procurement is not only about money. It is about export approvals, integration rights, software access, and certification timelines. In modern air combat, the missile is the weapon, but software is the gatekeeper. Now, let's talk about roles, because this is where the flying desk can become a quiet asset. Poland doesn't need every aircraft to be a mini F-16. It needs a force structure where the premium jets, the F-16s and eventually the F-35s, are not exhausted by tasks that do not require their full capability. Consider the growing requirement for counter-drone and air policing missions. These are time-consuming. They demand presence, patrol patterns, and quick reaction. They can also be economically punishing if you use your most expensive assets for every interception. A lighter jet with a decent radar, adequate speed, and suitable short-range weapons can take on a portion of that burden, especially in permissive or semi-permissive scenarios. But again, the limiting factor becomes weapons integration, not the aircraft's basic ability to fly and detect. This creates a paradox Poland is now managing in public. On one hand, it wants the F-A-50 fleet to be useful beyond training, because the regional threat environment rewards every extra sortie generator you can field. On the other hand, it cannot justify upgrading the early jets into a fighter standard when the fighter part is entangled in approvals, delays, and costs that may spiral. So the solution is to keep the delivered F-A-50GF aircraft primarily as training platforms, while quietly exploring alternative weapon fits and auxiliary mission packages that can deliver operational value without committing to a full PL transformation. And that leads to the bigger strategic read, Poland is trying to avoid a capability mirage. Announcing upgrades is easy. Delivering an integrated, certified, Supported combat system on schedule is hard. If the PL Block 20 pathway is delayed by radar procurement issues, by integration disputes, or by any broader turbulence on the supplier side, then upgrading the GF jets now could leave Poland with two half standards instead of one coherent fleet. By holding the GF jets at their current configuration and focusing them on training and selected auxiliary roles, Poland keeps its training pipeline stable and reduces the risk of spending money chasing a moving target. So is the modernization cancelled, or is it simply postponed until the fog clears? That is the question that matters. Publicly, economic inexpediency is a safe headline. Internally, the calculus is about uncertainty and control. Poland can control how it uses its current FA-50 GFs. It cannot fully control when a higher-end configuration becomes real, what weapons it will be allowed to carry, and how much rework will be needed when requirements shift again. In that context, choosing to treat the FA-50GF as a dedicated training and backup capability platform is not a downgrade. It's risk management. And if you want the final takeaway in one sentence, it's this, Poland is not stepping away from capability it is stepping away from paying twice for a capability that might not arrive in the form it was promised, at the time it was promised. The FA-50GF remains valuable, especially when pilot production and sortie generation are strategic priorities. 
The real question is whether Poland can unlock the weapon integration it needs, through European alternatives, revised agreements, or future policy shifts, to turn these flying desks into something more than training aircraft. Because if missiles are the currency of air power, then the aircraft is only as relevant as the supply chain and permissions that arm it.